Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Madeline Weld, who I've known for approximately a quarter century. Uh, we met physically uh, early in the 2000s in Ottawa. And uh, Dr. Weld has had an extensive education in the biological sciences and has worked both for universities and for the Canadian government in that capacity. Uh, she's been a major leader in Canada uh, in population studies and education. Uh, she's appeared in uh, media and uh, print media and uh, on radio and TV. So it's great, a great honor to uh, have her speak to us today uh, about the some of the myth, misconceptions about aging populations uh, and their supposed deleterious effects on human, human societies. So why don't you take it over, Madeline, and welcome. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and it's been great being a population NISTA colleague with you. Um, so my talk today is about, is natural population decline a concern? Now, I am trying to move, I'm not able to move, oh, here we are, move the slide. Um, is natural population decline a concern? I mean, when I first heard that question, it's, it was like, why is that even a question? Um, population decline is, is a necessity. We have gone in about 218 years, we went from 1 billion in 1804 to 8 billion in 2022, uh, something that is not not uh, sustainable. Um, I, on this uh, slide here with the different colors, I'll draw your attention to the enormous increase in population that occurred in Asia between, well, 18, they have 1820 there, but basically from when the world population went from 1 billion to, to 8 billion, there was an enormous increase in Asia, um, which is now starting to level off. And you can see that Africa is, is not as big as Asia, but it started, if you look at the, where the blue line started, it started from a much smaller um, level, about 100, 100 uh, million Africans in 1900 versus 1 1.4, close to 1 1.4 billion today. Um, and it is set to really expand now. And then Europe, not so much. But overall, the global population has, has massively increased and it is now at about 8 billion. So the question arises, is that sustainable and, and can we go on like this? The evidence shows that a population of 8 billion is not sustainable. Um, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of evidence to show that. We've been losing lots of farmland, topsoil erosion. Um, there's millions, hundreds of millions of people, about 800 and 60 or so people are, a million people are um, food insecure, deforestation, habitat loss, overfishing, collapse of fisheries. The list goes on. Um, uh, everybody in this talk could add a whole bunch of stuff to it. We are obviously depleting the earth with our current population. So if the current population is not sustainable, then it has to decline. Um, so the question is, will it be a semi-controlled contraction from a current level of overshoot because we have gone into overshoot? Or will it be an even higher plummet from a higher level of overshoot? Of course, I, I, I use the term semi-controlled because I don't think we can totally control things now, even, even with declining birth rates. Um, the future looks like it might be grim for, for a lot of people. But things will go a lot better for us if we accept that population decline is necessary and inevitable. And if we try to intelligently promote, intelligently and ethically promote that decline. Now, I know not everyone agrees with me. Um, Elon Musk thinks that it's um, population collapse is a major risk to the future of civilization. But he's a lot richer than me. But regardless of what he says, it's ecological collapse and not population collapse that threatens civilization. Now, the, the good news is that in much of the world, um, fertility is actually at or below replacement. The green here on the map shows the at or below replacement countries, and the red shows the countries that are still growing, which are essentially in, uh, in Africa and the 
Arabian Peninsula and also added on to that Iraq and Syria and then a few other places like like Afghanistan and Pakistan and Mongolia and Indonesia, Paraguay and, and Venezuela and Latin America and some, some Central American countries. But most of the world is now headed uh, or has a, a at replacement or below replacement um, a total fertility rate, which is 2.1 children per woman. Nevertheless, the population is, is still growing rapidly um, for several reasons. One, there's about 2.2 billion people who live in countries that still have above replacement fertility rates. Whereas 2.8 billion approx live in countries that have below fertility, below replacement rates, but are still growing because of the demographic momentum. Countries like India, Bangladesh, Brazil, Mexico, Iran, Vietnam, Turkey, and Malaysia. And that they have this demographic momentum because they have a very high proportion of young people who are in or about to enter their reproductive years. So population growth will still continue in those countries. And about 800 million people live in countries that are using immigration to keep growing. And that includes some European countries and uh, much of the Anglosphere, including, including Canada. And um, many of you probably know that last year, a total of over 1 million people came to Canada, either as permanent residents or non-permanent or, or temporary foreign workers or students. So Canada is the most rapidly growing country in the G7 and has even beat the, the overall growth rate of Africa. Um, and how about that? About 2.2 billion people live in countries that are already depopulating, Russia and Eastern European countries, and Japan, Italy, South Korea, Taiwan, Greece, Portugal, China, there's others. So the the it's very mixed. The, the total fertility rates and decline is very mixed around the globe. So the question is, why is there even a concern about population decline? And the answer is because our entire economic paradigm is based on growth. But the people who fear decline have things backwards. They think that population decline is an economic crisis that must be reversed, and we have to manage the environmental problems that arise from growth. But in fact, population decline is an environmental blessing, and we have to manage the economic problems that arise from degrowth, of which we need more. Elon Musk thinks we need more people to, to send them to Mars, but I don't think that's a big priority. I think saving the planet is a bigger one. Um, so what are the specific concerns that have been expressed about population decline? These are the ones that I've come across that there will be labor shortages, um, that the dependency ratio will become lopsided with an aging population, too many old people, not enough working age people. So the, the dependent working age people is 15 to 65, and the dependents are 14 and below and is over 65. There's also um, the concern that the falling fertility rates will send the populations in some countries into what's been called a spiral of permanent decline. And it's also been called a low fertility trap that countries may not be able to escape. And also the idea that economic shrinkage will have unpleasant side effects, as I said. So about the labor shortages, now, we've been hearing about Canada's labor shortages for decades, and at least despite 30 years of mass immigration, because Canada really ramped up its immigration under Mulroney um, in 1990, when they started, Canada started taking in about 250,000 people each year, regardless of economic circumstances. Um, and under Trudeau Sr., before that, the last year before that, it had only been about 87,000. So the same thing can be said of other countries that have had really high immigration levels, including the US, the UK, and Australia. But yet, despite this mass immigration, labor shortages persist, and they seem to be a permanent feature of economies based on perpetual growth. Well, at the same time, automation and artificial intelligence are you know, doing a lot of jobs that unskilled labor and increasingly even skilled labor used to do. 
but it's cheaper for businesses to import unskilled labor than to pay resident citizens better wages with benefits. Um, and it's also cheaper sometimes to import labor than to train them for skilled work. But my question is, why is cheap labor for businesses more important than good jobs for citizens? And many labor shortages, and in Canada, certainly housing shortages, are artificially created by mass immigration. We wouldn't be desperately short of medical workers and construction workers, et cetera, if we had a more sensible immigration policy. So the assertion that there are labor shortages is based entirely on the perspective of businesses. Um, and I think we should take the perspective of the working people more. This is an example of, of labor panic from an article in Forbes, which I'll, I'll give the reference to in a later slide. Um, but the Forbes article said, a lack of young labor tends to drive up wages, sparking the movement of jobs to other places. But don't we want people to have decent wages? It sounds very economy-centered as opposed to be human-centered. So Forbes is also concerned about what happens to the size of consumer markets and what it'll do to economic growth because old people consume less than younger ones. Um, but, you know, we need to shake our obsession with economic growth. Of course, consumer markets will shrink with a shrinking population, but we'll just have to shrink our way down. Um, and maybe one way of doing that is to have the population decline more rapidly than the economy, but we do need to face decline. So this is a, a slide from um, Visual Capitalist about what the concern is. So the red um, is the is the under fives, and the blues are the over sixty fives. So the percent in nineteen fifty at the left hand side, there about five percent of the people were over sixty five, and a, almost fifteen were were under five. So you have an approximately three to one ratio by twenty eighteen. They were both about 10%. Um, by 2050, you'll approximately have double the number because the uh, under fives are about 7% and the over 65s are you know, about 15. And by 2100, the way things are going, there's going to be a five-fold difference. The under fives will be about 5% and the over 65s will be about 25%. So that is something that seems to greatly concern economists. But I think we need to ask how catastrophic will an aging population really be? So we've got this um, dependency ratio that we've worked with for many years, the, uh, the working age people versus the 14 and unders and the over 65s. Um, and the concern is that there won't be enough workers to support all the old people and there'll be a rising tax burden for pensions and healthcare. But the thing is, people don't suddenly become dependent at age 65. I'm guessing that a lot of people attending this talk are 65 or older, including myself. Um, many older people have savings and assets that they leave to their children. And many old people engage in volunteer work and do useful things for free, including, I suppose, population activists. So the dependency ratio may be a challenge, but the current model is outdated in its rigidity. Uh, whoops. Oh, that. So how can a society deal with a population that's top heavy with old people? Well, we do have some examples already, and most notably Japan. And Japan is doing a lot better than countries with burgeoning populations of young people. So here are some things to consider. Um, we could reduce our expenses on caring for old people by promoting healthy living with less dependency on pills. I don't know if Big Pharma would like that, but I know a number of people my age approximately who have diabetes or are obese and are taking pills and things like that. And, you know, with a better lifestyle, they, they'd be healthier. With fewer children, there will be savings on money spent by parents on raising children and also on private and government daycare expenses and other childcare expenses. And uh, this is, might be a little bit controversial, but <laughs> many countries, including Canada, offer an assisted death to people with the terminal or life-diminishing conditions. I know that various um, dignity and dying or choice and dying organizations have 
have long been promoting this. Um, and this does not mean that we should hurry Granny off to, to get her medical assistance in dying so that Junior can get her inheritance. But um, I think the numbers are that about in, in Canada, that about half of what the government spends on your health care occurs in the last year or two of your life. And I mean, I'm, you know, both both my parents had a rather prolonged death on that choice in dying was not part of their vocabulary. They're a different generation. But I, for myself, I would certainly uh, prefer not to go down that road and take an exit. But anyway, so there are uh, this top heavy old age population is not probably going to be as catastrophic as people imagine. Um, and we got there, this upside down pyramid with more old people than young. It's an inevitable outcome of the massive expansion of population that happened during the 20th and early 21st century when we went from 1.6 billion in 1900 to 8 billion in 2022. And we increased life expectancy at both ends. Many more infants are surviving all over the world now. And um, people are living longer. But the population we've reached, 8 billion, is not sustainable. And it can decline by decreasing the birth rate, increasing the death rate, or a combination of the two. Most people would probably agree that decreasing the birth rate is preferable to increasing the death rate. So we'll just have to wait for the old people to die off because trying to keep the number of young people higher than the number of old people is a Ponzi scheme of perpetual growth and it's impossible ecologically. However, um, countries remain steeped in the growth mindset and several have tried to reverse the decline with in incentives and have been unsuccessful. Russia for a brief time managed to um, increase the birth rate a bit, but not for long. And in addition to Japan and South Korea, I know France and Denmark and various other countries have tried to increase the birth rate. And we've got a sort of a standing incentive with a, a baby bonus for every baby that a person has. But all attempts to increase the birth rate have uh, had only short-lived success or have entirely failed. And the most well, saddest case, I guess, is South Korea, which spent over 200 billion um, over 16 years and um, has the lowest fertility rate in the world at 0.79 children per woman. So if the governments, instead of trying to give money to young couples to have more children while they're running the rat race of an economy based on growth, why not find ways to improve the overall well-being by slowing things down? And Japan, even though it's tried to increase the birth rate, it has failed to do so. And it's an example of a country that has su succeeded quite well in dealing with an aging population. It's had a decreasing population since 2010 and um, never got its birth rate up again. Its economy has not grown much since the 1990s, but the quality of life of its citizens is still good. And in terms of unemployment and inequality indicators, it's better off than most European countries. And according to the UN, by 2030, which is pretty soon, Japan will have more people over 80 than under 15. But if you were a free-floating soul and given the choice of being born in Japan or a country with a population growing rapidly um, due to high fertility, which would you choose? Well, I know I would choose I'd rather be born in Japan than Afghanistan or Sudan or something. Um, so one of the concerns is the spiral of permanent decline. So can a sub-replacement fertility rate that goes on over time lead to a spiral of permanent decline? And that's the concept that a population that has a sub-replacement fertility rate for generations um, will go into a decline from which it can't recover and eventually die out. So there were studies, um, especially those of John Calhoun in the 50s and 60s, and I guess some in the 70s, that showed that when rodent, he, he would create these um, rodent utopias and they'd have everything they need in terms of food and water and bedding and stuff like that. Um, but when their population became too dense, they would uh, their behavior would change. They'd become, you know, antisocial and 
a lot of them wouldn't reproduce and the animals basically became dysfunction dysfunctional and even after the population density had fallen um, the stressed animals never recovered and the population died out so it seems that the, the stress induced physiological changes that precluded recovery so if young people today are choosing not to have children or only one child because modern life is so stressful wouldn't it make more sense to make modern life less stressful um, which would happen with a smaller population and a less frenetic pace of life i.e not forever growth um so this is the that forbes magazine re reference and it had an article called death spiral demographics the country shrinking the fastest and one of the things that was concerned about was that aging populations with fewer young workers and families threaten weak economic growth as both labor and consumption begin to decline but contracting contracting labor and i.e population and consumption which is our collective ecological footprint is pretty much exactly what we need to do and um, the regarding the shrinking population Forbes said if this were just a European disease, it would not prove such a challenge to the economic future. And then it discussed population decline in Asia. Well, you saw in that previous um, graph how the Asian population had exploded during the 20th century. So I don't think it's a disease that, that, that it's declining, that Asia is not growing. I think the disease is um, the way humanity is devouring the planet. Um, the low fertility trap that was postulated by Wolfgang Lutz and he and his colleagues suggested that the combination of demographic cultural and economic forces that had driven down fertility in Europe were becoming self-reinforcing and irreversible but Norwegian economist Vigard Skurbeck didn't agree and um, answered with his book Decline and Prosper changing global birth rates and the advantages of fewer children. Uh, Skurbeck argued that depopulating countries could continue to thrive by adjusting pension systems, health, health services, and infrastructure, which seems very reasonable because the growthists seem to think we just have to adjust environmentally while we keep going. And, and fertility rates can go up after they've gone down. It's happened before. And the most recently, I guess, during the Great Depression, when the fertility rate went was low, but then it bounced back post-war with the baby boom, which many of us are members. So in some future, let's imagine a future world where overpopulation isn't a thing and people have lives of less stress, um, I don't see why the fertility rate couldn't recover. But for the foreseeable future, a low fertility rate is a is a good thing. So economic shrinkage will have unpleasant side effects. I'm sure it will, but so will environmental collapse. So the Financial Times had a, an article from 2022, uh, from 2020, um, and citing John Maynard Keynes, um, a lecture he gave in 1937 called Some Economic Consequences of a Declining Population. Keynes was aware that overpopulation was going to, it was a problem. Um, but he noted that there'd be, uh, you know, upheavals with economic and population decline. And so then they discussed that a bit, the uh, Financial Times, you know, um, he feared stagnation, low growth and interest rates, that sort of thing. And then um, citing Keynes, they also say, with a stationary population, we shall be absolutely dependent on for the maintenance of prosperity and civil peace on policies of increasing consumption by a more equal distribution of incomes or of forcing down the rate of interest. Well, a more equal distribution of incomes isn't necessarily a bad thing. And he concluded by saying, I only wish to warn you that chaining up of the one devil, that's population growth, may, if we are careless, only serve to loose another still fiercer and more intractable. However, I would say we'd been we've been careless with the environment by pursuing economic policies based on perpetual growth. Um, our current consumption level of renewable natural resources like forests and fisheries is, exceeds what nature can regenerate. 
our modern techno-industrial society depends on a lot of non-renewable natural resources um, that are also finite and can't be regenerated, and that we extract from Earth at great environmental cost and great financial cost often. And no area on Earth is safe from us anymore, not even the bottom of the oceans. They're not now plans to engage in deep sea mining. So <laughs> we can destroy the deep sea creatures as well as the ones on land. And so, and also what will happen to however man, many billion people there are when their needs for survival exceed what the planet can provide? That scenario is worse than population decline. So instead of fighting population decline, we should spend our energy on trying to smooth the transition to a smaller population and just accept that we need to have a smaller population. And the question is, why should economic growth be our primary goal anyway? Um, there's several studies one could cite, I'm citing two of them here, uh, that show that economic growth, which is driven by population growth, population growth has not benefited anyone. It said, we have looked for, that's my highlight, not theirs, we have looked for and not found any convincing economic arguments for continued population growth. Um, the, the vitality of business and the welfare of the average person does not depend on it. And the Science Council of Canada, um, which was disbanded by Mulroney, but in 1976, it wrote a report called Popu uh, it wrote a report called Population, Technology, and Resources. And it drew attention to a rapidly how a rapidly growing population would exacerbate the stresses caused by existing patterns of production and consumption. And it, it noted that everything is is limited. There are limits to growth. Here are a couple of quotes um, by people on on the economy. Um, Partha das, das Gupta asks. How did economic theory come to discount the natural world as an important part of our economic wealth? And, and then he goes on to say that once upon a time, we didn't know much about ecology when that economic growth was, theory was developed, but now we have no excuse for, for continuing to discount it. And Brian Check advocates degrowth to a steady state economy. Um, he advocates not only for decreasing gross domestic product, but for different values, fewer work hours, deliberately lower consumption, and an attitude of enough versus one of perpetually more. Of course, our current economic paradigm advocates for never having enough and always wanting more. So there's a thing called the Human Development in Index. Um, which is a, a value which is determined by aggregating a country score in a large assortment of indicators, not just GDP, such as life expectancy, literacy, access to electricity, per capita GDP, which is more important than GDP, and um, things like homicide rates, poverty, poverty index, and income inequality, internet availability, and that sort of thing. So the highest scoring countries for the Human Development Index have low population growth rates. The lowest scoring countries have high population growth rates. I wish our Canadians lead, Canadian leaders would listen to that. Herman Daly said that economic growth could become uneconomic growth, that is growth in production for which the marginal costs are greater than the marginal benefits. Growth that in reality makes us poorer, not richer. Um, and I think our densifying cities are an example of that. Daily distinguished between growth and development. Developments mean something is getting better, which may or may not involve growth. Like in a developing child, growth is good, but in an adult, a continuing growth just means you're getting fat. Uh, the GDPs in modern societies have been growing since the 1950s, but many indicators of well being have been declining, including personal happiness, grow, growing income, in, there's growing income inequality, there's more addiction a higher incidence of family breakdown, less affordable housing, and more homelessness, deteriorating infrastructure, less social cohesion, less trust of institutions and government. So overall, is the quality of life getting better with all this, this growth? And the answer seems to be no, no, it isn't. 
This is from Australia, but this exactly the same thing applies to Canada, that a growing GDP, which is driven by population growth, has not increased the average, um, the per, per capita GDP at all. And here we see that Australia's population grew by about 6 million between 1999 and 2017. Um, but the per capita GDP uh, growth averaged less than 1%. And I think that growth in population has decreased the quality of life in um, a lot of Australian cities, especially the rapidly growing ones like Melbourne, where housing is also unaffordable, just like it is in Canada. So Canada's growth has affected workers and bankers differently. Workers pay more and bankers get more. And here on the left, you see the housing price index and how it's gone up um, since 2000 in pretty much all of Canada's big cities, um, led by, by Hamilton, Vancouver, and Toronto, where it's gone way up. But even the other big cities, they've, the houses are, the houses, house prices have approximately doubled since Trudeau came to power, I think. Um, Meanwhile, the total outstanding mortgages, which is what bankers benefit from, have also gone up. So Canadians are paying more and uh, bankers are making more from housing. Debt levels in Canada have gone up considerably um, and over the last uh, 20 years and even more if, if one were to go back further. And debt, of course, is a, a form of stress. So this is a slide that John Mayer of Canadians for Sustain a Sustainable Society made, um, showing how the rate of growth, which has gone nuts in the city of Barrie, right there at the far right, um, is negatively associated with life satisfaction. Um, so again, the question is, why are we promoting growth? Why is growth the, the holy grail that we're pursuing? Alberta has a thing called a genuine progress indicator, which looks at various aspects of, of well-being. And it in this graph, it shows that the GDP rose steadily between 1961 and 1999. It rose by 2.4% annually, but its genuine progress in indicator was either stagnant or falling. It, all that growth had no positive impact on the actual genuine progress indicator. This is a, a relatively recent uh, study from Europe from 2020, which uh, looked at um, whether people, whether having biodiversity around made people happier. And it looked at the number of bird species as a measure of biodiversity. And it found that an additional 10% of bird species in a neighborhood where a person lived, um, increased life satisfaction as much as a comparable increase in income. So they, in their summary, they say nature conservation thus constitutes an investment in human well-being. Well, of course, growth um, is ant antithetical to nature conservation. So what are the metrics that are used to show that a growing population increases the quality of, of life? The GDP has grown, but not per capita wealth. And that certainly applies in Canada, where a lot of things are becoming more unaffordable. And, and housing now takes up about 60% of a person's income rather than about 30%. Happiness levels do not increase in a big city. Housing has become less affordable. Access to nature has been reduced. Debt levels are much higher. Equality levels are lower. We've fallen to mid 30s place from being very much near the top. Job quality has declined in 2017. Then um, Finance Minister Bill Morneau said that young Canadians face a job churn, which raises the question why bring in so many newcomers then? So, to, to summarize everything I had said, um, Rapid population growth in the 20th and early 20th centuries have brought us to a population of 8 billion. The population is not sustainable, as we've seen by many indicators. Uh, 
the only way to reduce the human population to a sustainable level is to decrease births or increase deaths or a combination of the two. Of those two, reducing births is more desirable. Therefore, we'll inevitably go through a period where the number of old people is very large. This is not a crisis to be avoided, but a transition that must be made. It's only a crisis if your holy grail is continuous economic growth. Continuous population growth through fertility or immigration is a Ponzi scheme. Um, it privatizes the profits and socializes the economic, social, and environmental costs of growth. Overpopulation leads to resource scarcity, resource deg degradation, ecological decline, conflict over resources, and the stress of daily living. If our leaders focus on human well-being instead of economic growth, population decline would not be so scary for them. Thank you. That's all I have to say on the subject. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, this is Steve. Um, there's only nine entries in the chat. So if anybody else wants to enter a question or comment, I suggest you uh, get to it pretty quickly. Uh, I'm going to just start with one tangent on um, a section of your talk. Okay. which had to do with uh, your comments from Das Gupta and Brian Cech. Uh, I met Brian uh, about 20 years ago at a uh, population strategy conference in DC. Um, and we've been in touch ever since. <clears throat> it seems that many in the green movement think that declining consumption on a voluntary basis is doable. And yet uh, scientifically, it's highly unlikely. Um, there's a maximum power principle developed by Latka and then further developed by uh, Howard Odom. <clears throat> and humans are not exempt from this in which species seek to maximize the efficiency uh, of throughput, not necessarily total volume, but getting the most bang for their buck, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And humans that are into voluntary simplicity are a tiny a percentage of the population. And that's because most people are on autopilot and it's biologically driven. Mm -hmm. So it seems that trying to work on the economic consumption side is a no-win game. Uh, this is yeah. my addition to your, your discussion. Yeah. So that scale, the scale factor, the numbers factor in population is the only way that I can see to increase the per capita well-being because people are still going to seek more energy and that includes all the uses, you know, of that so-called economic growth gives people. Well, I, well, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I totally yeah. agree because people don't want to live like, hermits or monks or whatever i mean people mm -hmm. want to you know eat well have fun go places i mean they want to live um mm -hmm. when when the shutdown when the coronavirus shutdown locked everybody up i mean there's an increase in drug addiction and suicide and su even suicides and yes. um, socially mm -hmm. aberrant behavior and it was, it was very very stressful for a lot of people and the studies of bill reese um have shown when you looked at, I think it was um, greenhouse gas emissions increase, like what contributed most to the increase over a particular period of time. It was the increase in the, what is it, the middle, high middle income countries, like the high income countries like Canada, they we're already living pretty high on the hog. So we don't really need to increase our consumption for well being. But in countries that are starting to develop, um, well, in China, when it started to develop economic, its pork consumption went way up. And um, people, you know, and me eating meat is one of the things that the environmentalists are trying to get us to do less of. But eating meat is one of the things that people do more of as soon as they start getting a little bit more wealth. 
so yeah voluntary if if we depend on voluntary simplicity i don't think we'll get very far and working with canadians for a sustainable society they, they were in contact with the, my colleagues that were in contact with a bunch of anti sprawl sprawl groups and um save lake simcoe and all this sort of stuff and these anti sprawl groups didn't want to touch population with a 10 foot pole you know it's like oh it's the rich the rich uh, colonialist sort of thing well no it's the numbers as well because everybody needs energy everybody consumes food building those things uses a lot of energy you know the cement steel all that sort of stuff um the saving lake simcoe people i think they thought if too much population like around aurelia and Lake Simcoe, they thought maybe they could divert the um, pollutants to Lake Ontario, like Lake Ontario needs more pollution, the Great Lakes have 40 million people living around them. We cannot avoid the numbers issue, we just have to address it. Okay, uh, thanks. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> but okay. Some people seem to take it as a personal insult when you say there's too many people. No, it's like... You know, an engineer might say this ferry only holds so many people and, you know, more can't get on. Yeah. Well, human exceptionalism the... has been brainwashed into people through religions, but I'm not going to go further into that. <laughs> no, let, let's, let's avoid that. <laughs> avoid that one. Uh, okay, I'm looking at the uh, chat now, and a gentleman named Peter Bolkowski said he had to leave before the question period, but he has a practical question for which I would like to see an answer. <clears throat> Given that the political elite, liberal and conservative and NDP, favor, perhaps not openly, a population in Canada of 100 million by the end of the century, how do you propose to have that policy rejected by the general population, and not just by believers such as those listening to this presentation? Well, you know, I, I see this, what the Century Initiative is doing as an orchestrated um, strategy by the growthist to keep the the gravy the gravy train going because they were formed in 2011 and prior to that like in 2010 i've got in my files articles where people are promoting a population of 100 million of people writing for the like the globe and mail um and, I, and then it seems to me okay then the century initiative comes and it's promoting this and it, it's founded by two guys dominic Barton and Mark Wiseman. Uh, so Dominic Barton was with McKinsey and Company for over 30 years, a big wig there, um, which was a, a consulting company and making a lot of money. And interestingly, after Dominic Barton left in 2018, it got a great big contract with um, Immigration and Citizenship Canada. Uh, great. And Mark Wiseman at the time was um, a, a director of... Um, BlackRock, so the huge major investment company, and he he was also in charge of something called other business or whatever, which included real estate assets. So all of this um, driving Canadians uh, off, you know, Canadians can't afford houses, but BlackRock can buy them up and then rent them out. So I see the Century Initiative as a strategy to transfer money from the working class and the middle class to the elites. And I, how do we fight it? I don't know because if you have if you control the media and everything i think we just continue promoting our ideas um talking to people when you see the comments to articles it seems to me that a lot of canadians are totally not that enthused about growth um and are starting to see that it's a problem but unfortunately we don't have as much power as politicians. I think, I mean, to me, to me, it just shows that there's a lot of corruption in the system. Yeah, to get a big megaphone, you need big bucks is what it amounts to. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Paul Henry Beckwith is uh, next. And I don't know if he's online or he, if he is, I'd hope he'd unmute himself and uh, show his face. And Otherwise, I'll have to read it. <laughs> Paul, are you there? Yeah. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, Madeline. Uh, I think we've had some discussions personally. Uh, it's been a long time ago, but uh, thank you. Great talk. Um, so 
do you have a gut feeling for what population will peak at and when? I guess that's my major question. Boy, I um, am very nervous about making predictions. But one thing that encourages me is that in the last year, um, 2022, I think the world population only increased by, only in quotation marks, increased by 67 million and the year before it was 81 million. And I was kind of surprised that the drop was that big. Um, I mean, it's still insanely too much, but it's going in the right direction. And it, it was kind of a big chunk. So, and all of those countries that are at or below the um, replacement rate is a good thing. Now, I think, you know, some countries are completely messing things up by virtue of um, their policies, including Canada, which would have stabilized its population because we've had a total fertility rate of 2.1 or well below. It's now 1.4 since 1971. And we'd be about 27 million people with a balanced migration policy, but we're 40 and growing, um, which is through immigration. So countries like Canada and a lot of the Anglosphere with their immigration policies are, are wrecking <laughs> wrecking their own success, so to speak, and in, in stabilizing their population. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess, um, you know, we see uh, UN uh, projections, maybe 10 billion by 2070, 11 billion peaking. You know, those sort of projections seem like they're absolutely ludicrous to me, given uh, the rate of accelerating abrupt climate change. I mean, you know, if temperatures continue to rise as projected by, say, Hansen, James Hansen and others, you know, we're going to have um, huge drops in yields of food grown around the world, say, within the next decade or so. So we'll have starvation and very high food costs. And, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that, that can re greatly reduce the projections. I mean, I like um, James Lovelock projection of 1 billion people by 2100, you know, that sort of thing. Exactly. So I guess, uh, so my gut feeling is, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to get nowhere near 10 or 11 billion. Well, you know, I'm kind the climate, of, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of, kind of uh, tending to agree with you because uh, projections, they aren't really predictions in that projections assume um, things will continue, the present trend will continue. But if you look at like the U, the UN projections you were talking about, and then you look at things like that says that um, not, virtually all of the fisheries are being fished at or beyond capacity, and that's at eight billion. And you know the huge, the large specimens people used to catch are are no longer abundant. So that shows that reproduction isn't keeping up with um, use uh, or harvesting of the fish. And then you wonder, okay, so this is at 8 billion or, you know, 7 billion, 8 billion, what's it going to be like at 10 billion? And maybe there will be collapse. I mean, as I see it, continued growth increases the likelihood of collapse and more catastrophic collapse. And this is what we are pushing for when we still push for economic growth. I mean, why, yeah. why is that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, basically, we're pushing for a scenario where we reach, uh, we end up having billions of people dying to reduce population. Yeah. And we can see that coming. So isn't it morally uh, correct now to start working on the, uh, you know, reducing the, the growth rates? I mean, climate will do it, but do we really, is it, do we really, we can see what's coming, I mean, clearly. And I think, uh, you know, I don't know why politicians and, and uh, power structures are still so blind to it. I guess they don't really care about us really. Us I think, being the, you know what, I think, I think for them, we're not any more important than lab rats. Um, right, exactly. Yeah. So is it time for the guillotine, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of people would agree with you that it is time, time for the guillotine. <laughs> get out, get out your pitchforks. Yeah, like they're not going to give up their power um, voluntarily. No, I right. don't. And, they and they have to be forced out by 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 the general population. And then so. I wonder what kind of a mind virus has affected, for example, the the UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, when it talks about 
population alarmism last November when the world population reached 8 billion. You know, it said 8 billion opportunities or, you know, whatever. It's kind of like it was a celebration instead of um, the catastrophe that it actually is. No, it's not population alarmism. And not that long ago, the UNFPA was also concerned about population growth. But I, I mean, the, after the um, Cairo conference in 1992, they really downplayed the population control aspect and linked it to all kinds of bad things like China's horrible policy and colonialism instead of, um, and they just focused on reproductive health and rights. And they said everyone should have the right to freely and responsibly determine the number and spacing of their children. But if they do that without any government help or programs, then then local customs and the local priest or mullah or whatever will have the main say and fertility rates remained high. In fact, in some countries, they went up a little bit after the Cairo conference and spending on family planning itself went down. So, so I, I mean, I really think um, national governments, international and, and international organizations have failed. And, and right now with the UNFPA talking about population alarmism, it's like it's, it's gone Marxist or something. And, you know, political correctness is more important than actually developing intelligent policies and helping governments implement intelligent policies. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I think, yeah. I think we'll have to carry on <clears throat> to other questions. Um, we can, can pick up this at the end of the session if we still have people around for, that are interested in doing that. Uh, Ted Manning is next and he's got a, a little statement and a question. Actually, I'm going to go in a totally different direction. So the only okay. time you can steer lemmings is when they're actually running. Uh, but the uh, point is, uh, Madeline, I think you've hit, hit the nail on the head perfectly, uh, that our obsession with growth and the notion that everybody's obsession is with and should be with growth is what's really leading us astray. And some of you know that we've been doing some work at the Club of Rome on trying to come up with different definitions of well-being. And quite frankly, growth is very seldom very high on the list. But that said, uh, it's very differential now. And your graph very much showed that Africa is the big issue, as well as a couple of other places. Uh, whereas, uh, quite frankly, if you were able to build a wall between the two, only the stuff on the other side would be growing. The stuff on, on, on the north side would not be. Mm -hmm. So I think my, my one warning is we can't really treat global massive growth as a NIMBY. And that it really comes down to a lot of different places that need different policies. So that is a preamble. What policies can we put in for places like Canada, like Africa, or like Japan that will, in fact, lead to not uh, unacceptable solutions? Well, I, I actually think that we do have to be a little bit nimby in that every country and the UN the UN's program of action arising from the Cairo yeah. conference actually said um, in one of its paragraphs that every country has to take responsibility for its own population for stabilizing mm -hmm. its own population like because the only country we have any influence on really the only country we can vote in or do anything in is Canada and even there where we don't seem to have much influence um, if if every if if migration were completely free around the world, then any country that has managed to sort of make a good thing and have a small population and sort of maintain the wealth, it, it would be flooded, which is you know happening under the in the U.S. southern border right now. Um, so I think what Canada's policy should be is to stabilize its own population because its own land surface cannot support that many people. We're destroying our best farmland with with massive migration, um, we're, we're causing a lot of ecological damage. But what we can do is help other countries develop programs and use our, our knowledge and skills, um, you know, medical, health, otherwise, um, to, to promote small families. And um, because we, you know, in Niger has still has over five kids per woman. I think a few years ago, it was seven. I think it's come down a, a little bit. But we, we cannot solve the problems of those countries by bringing them to our country. For one thing, when we, with migration, we take in only a tiny fraction of the annual growth. Mm -hmm. 
And we take what we're doing is we're taking the most educated very often of those countries who need their most educated. So our so, so do we have any ethical need to do anything, or should we just watch them die on the other side of the field? Well, we what we've been doing instead of watching them die is providing food without mm -hmm. saying um, without providing or, or helping them establish population control programs. Mm -hmm. So we can be ethical, but I, I think you know encouraging. Well, again, I sharing our knowledge expertise, health, um, but encouraging smaller families. I mean, one thing that is not much discussed is the enormous amount of corruption that there is. And there's an enormous amount of corruption in Canada, but there's, I'd say, even more in, in most African countries and much of our aid, um, because we have spent tens of billions of dollars in aid, has been subverted for other purposes, which not for what it, it's, it's meant for. But, you know, we, we cannot solve the problems of the world. We've got enough in Canada. We've got enough homelessness in Canada. But there was recently a video made, at, like it's a, less than a week or maybe two weeks old, of refugees who are staying, who are living in 10 cities in Toronto because the shelters don't have room for them. And they're blaming it on racism. Well, no, it's not racism. It's we can't even look after our own. Everywhere in Ottawa now, at every pretty much at every main on ramp and off ramp on the Queensway, and you know some major intersections, there's a, a beggar person looking for money. That I don't remember that at all. I mean, just a few decades ago, that there that wasn't a thing. Um, we're doing a poor job looking after our own. Um, so I think we we can. Um, help in the world we can share our knowledge we can promote family planning but taking in more people is not part of the solution so where do they go where do they go well they they stay where they're born i mean did i don't know if you've ever seen roy beck of numbers usa he had a video on um what is it Im poverty immigration and gumballs Mm -hmm. And he did you see that video with gumballs represents a million people? So he had the US population of two, 200 and whatever million at the time. And then the, you know, these different columns, uh, plexiglass columns with gumballs of all these other people. And then there's 80 mm -hmm. million added each year. And even if the US takes one gumball, one million people, or even two million people, or three, it makes no difference essentially to the annual increase. So we cannot solve the world's problems with immigration. What we can do if we have mass immigration is destroy more of our far farmland, make us less capable of feeding ourselves and the world. And, and then what? Then there's more people starving? I, I don't see it as a solution. Okay, let's continue, please. Uh, good discussion. <clears throat> Samrat, I don't know how to pronounce it, Bar Baradwaj, are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Thank you for uh, your question. Carry on. Uh, thanks, Mandolin, for, uh, for that amazing presentation. Since I'm from India and it has like a huge population problem, my question was that if so many people are packed uh, together in places like Africa, India, and many other parts, then they will run away. Like how you just pointed out that they should stay where they are. Naturally, it doesn't work. Yeah. So my question was that why have borders? You know, once you create borders, then you create limits. Like you're very right that uh, uh, like in the case of Canada, there should be only so many people and in the case of the world. Yeah, would like to hear what you have to say for that. Well, so I, I'm, I'm not sure, are you saying there should be a borderless world? Yes, because borders are kind of like new inventions for two, three hundred years. We've well, had borders, let's say. I, I don't know. Here. I think um, maybe yeah. official borders, but tribes have been fighting over territory since time immemorial. Right. I mean, and, and animals are territorial and of territories. They don't have borders, of course. But basically, a group of people establishes, you know, something. Um, now, I, I don't know how. I, I Why are you assuming that Canada should solve the problem, say, of somebody in India who has seven children, if is the responsibility not on the Indian government to promote smaller families or, um, you know, to try to, to, to try to help 
their own people? Yes, absolutely. And I live in Spain. So the similar problem that Canada faces right now, Spain mm -hmm. is at the helm of that, mm -hmm. right? So my question is more like if we create borders, we separate people and then the problem starts. You know, well, it's just that, it's just observation. But it's not even course, a question, um, thank you. Right, well, the, the problem without borders, there have been, um, you know, it's, um, it would be like an invasion because if suppose i mean suppose all of india all 1.4 indians wanted to move to canada of course that's not possible but um how could the canadian government function i mean even now we see you know conflicts between different groups and and um it <laughs> with more groups and more special interests and less resources, fewer resources, things yeah. would get even tougher. Yeah. And, and what about employment? Um, you know, a country might not even have, have the work and... Right, I, okay, I thank know. you. Yeah, okay. No, yeah, great, yeah, thank you so much. All right. All right. <clears throat> Jack Alpert is next and you've got two entries here, Jack, so I'll let you present it as you like. You're not there, Jack. Oh. Maybe not. Jack Alpert, last call. I, I saw him and he just disappeared. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Hi. No, I'm, oh, I'm here. Is. Oh, there I'm, you are. I'm having trouble with my phone. Okay. Uh, I just, I, what, I just wanted that, that question asked generally. Can you just read it, Steve? Well, it's in two places. First... first, the first one had the first sentence truncated. The second said, "Okay, second if said, humankind all... was in possession of the capability to limit global births to half a million per year globally, right?" Then uh, it says, "Most women have no children for fifty years. After that, they can have as many as they want. Well, after they're fifty years old, I don't think they're going to have any, but." <laughs> Uh, would, would implementing the process create more injury or less injury than our present path? Well, I know where, what you mean, Jack, is uh, you're saying if birth could be controlled to that degree. Uh, well, it's, it's a big if with the probabilities probably being very, very low that it could happen uh, given the lack of uh, coordination, even country to country or region of countries to other regions of the same country like the US. And I'll let you carry on verbally if you want to, Jack, for a couple of minutes. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm coming through. Yeah, you I are. hear you. All right, Madeline, the question is that there are two paths forward. There's the path forward of, of having the whole world implement something that would severely limit birth, which would be a terrible imposition on everyone. I mean, everybody would be injured by not being able to have children. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is that, are those injuries that would be created by imposing a birth moratorium for 50 years be worse, would we create more injuries than, than the injuries created by our path forward? Well, I think if you had a birth moratorium for 50 years, you pretty much guarantee extinction because suppose a baby girl is born and then 50 no. only 50 years later she can have a a kid well she might have gone through menopause um so i don't think no, that... no wait a minute let's not you you you're at you're adding you're adding to the problem okay. i said that there would be a half a million births per year okay means in 100 years we would have we would have 50 million people Okay, well, because we would have a hundred cohorts of half a million. Well, I think the earth would be a better place with 50 million people, but I don't think that I, that, I don't know who would implement the 500. Don't, don't, don't ask the question about who would implement it. Answer the question is the injury caused by preventing people from having babies a bigger injury than letting them experience our current path? Well, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, the 
you know, um, the injuries produced by preventing people from having babies, I think we saw an example of that in China where they used extremely um, coercive measures, including forced abortions and uh, and as a result of which a lot of baby girls were exposed and left to die um, in, in horrible ways. I think I think implementing that would cause a lot of injury. Um, and I don't I don't know if you can answer that. You know, it's all hypothetical if you if you don't say well, how are how are we going to do that? You're, 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 um, at, you're adding a problem. You're you're talking about the various historical implementations. And what happened with them and what happened to the people and what happened to the people who, who were unfairly sterilized. Don't do that. Just answer the question. Just imagine the question. It's do an absurd, any, it's an absurd any, question. Yeah. It's, it's a ridiculous question. I mean, is a half million going to be the rich people's kids? Like, like it's completely absurd fantasy question. Who, um, who's speaking? Paul Beckwith. Okay, we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to stop this this topic. How can she answer the question? Like it's a crazy question. No, I I agree with you, Paul, but <laughs> I had to give Jack his chance. Thanks. It's, no it's sense. a thought experiment based on an infinitesimally small possibility of reality. Period. So <clears throat> we're ready for Mike Nickerson. I'm sorry, we I skipped Karen Schrag. If you still you're there, Karen. Well, I guess she just made a comment. <clears throat> oh, there's okay. There she really? is. She's, she's muted, but um... well, okay, Karen. Hmm. Can somebody unmute Karen? I think oh, I just did. Here she comes. Yeah, she did. Okay, good. Karen Schrag, are you there? I am here. Excellent. Hi, Madeline. Hi, Karen. <laughs> Art's no, I, see your comment. I just wanted to turn you loose. Okay, no, I'm just completely agree with everything you said, Madeline. And, and I think that nothing, nothing, nothing can be um, really discussed up until people get that we're so severely overpopulated. And if they understood that this question or this argument, as you said, wouldn't even be on the table. It's like, when your house is on fire, you don't say, should I add another floor? I think you should put the fire out first. And yeah, exactly. Um, and, and and yeah, I mean, I have nothing to add to what you said other than that we, we have to also remember that growth happens in two ways. One is um, births over deaths, the other is migration. And just a little bit of growth in a, in a countries like uh, Australia, Canada, and US, Great Britain is horrible because we're already um, on the consumption level that we consider it normal for everyone to have a refrigerator and a microwave. and and two cars in the garage and that's normal. So that people coming from, I think the statistic is that we um, add the carbon footprint to every immigrant coming from an un underdeveloped country to the US by four times. So there were increasing carbon footprint um, and we can see with all the wildfires and the heat waves going on right now, that that's a really not good thing to do. So um, in the big, big picture, everything is, hap is helped by degrowth and the economies need to be reworked. And there's people like Brian Check who are out there ready to help because they've already studied this problem. Um, but but what's irritating me right now and, and is a discussion I just saw on Overpopulation Project, which said that um, this whole idea of developed versus, versus undeveloped countries and both are overpopulated. If I you know, ride a bicycle today instead of drive a car, that will not help somebody in Niger or Nigeria or Sudan um, get water. And so a lot of these problems are so local. And I just wanted to just give you a big kudos yeah. for your presentation. Garrett Harden wrote a, an article on that. Yeah. Didn't you? that About that, potholes? Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it, it says there is no global population problem. There's 180 national population problems. There are 180 countries at the time he wrote that. But he said, like potholes, um, population is a local problem and every country has to address it in ways that are appropriate for them culturally and you know they're religiously or whatever however they go about it but you know uh, um you mentioned the fourfold increase in the u.s in in greenhouse gas emissions which 
is exactly the same in Canada. The average immigrant is, is uh, calculated by John Mayer of um, Canadians for a Sustainable Society is 4.2. Because to live in Canada, you need to have, um, you need to heat your home. Nobody can live in Canada without heating their home. Mm -hmm. So, so, and most Canadians live very close to the U.S. border. Um, so where are we going to put all these people? If we put them in farther north, we'd have to, you know, we'd have to provide them with, with food and heat for their home, which we'd have to transport with fuel, fossil fuel powered vehicles, because electric vehicles don't, don't work very well in the, uh, you know, in, in very cold climates. So, yeah, so anyway. <laughs> Yeah, and none of it makes sense. It's like I would say if you're if you're too um, pro people, you're not pro people at all because the anthrop there's anthropocentrism at the core of all this argument, which is we always have to help people, but as we help as we help more of them, we help less of them. Exactly, we need more humanity with fewer humans is what we need. Bingo! I want a T-shirt that says that. Okay. <laughs> hey, Mike Nickerson, are you ready? Dodie, could you close the door, please? It's really noisy. I, I, uh, I just put in a good word for the uh, the reducing consumption aspect. More fun, less stuff is our uh, our guiding line. Oh. Uh, I know mentioned in the chat that you know all we're up against is a six hundred billion dollar a year advertising industry that says we need more stuff. And if there was a possible way of changing the balance of propaganda, mm -hmm. um, that would be the way to go. But if somebody commented, you uh, need a lot of money to get a big megaphone. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I mean, the media are owned by the growthists, which is, yeah. which mm -hmm. is. It's unfortunate. Um, my question, a uh, simpler question is, the United States has this anti-abortion thing coming on. Is that ex a pr conceived as a way of increasing their population? You know, I don't know. The abortion issue has become so political. And I, I mean, I think a lot of the people who are anti-abortion are, are sincerely motivated by their religious beliefs. I, I get that impression. Um, but, you know, I, I don't agree with them. And I especially don't understand why they would want to stop that morning after pill before the conceptive is actually implanted. Um, you know, the early, if, if everybody had access to those, um, there'd be way fewer abortions needed. So I, I think the, uh, the abortion thing has really been brought to prominence, um, maybe because they are, the Christian conservatives are an important part of the base of, well, I guess, of the Republican Party. And you know, I, I mean, I think the Republican Party makes more sense on immigration than the Democrats, which basically want open border. But I think that abortion thing is, is kind of unfortunate. And I hope yeah. that, um, and, you know, Americans continue to have access via the states that where they haven't gone completely nuts on abortion. Well, as an American, I can second Madeline's opinion. Religion is the driving mm -hmm. force. Uh, the politicians take advantage of that and leverage yeah. The notion of the big megaphones, if you've got a real lot of money, you can have an enormous megaphone that doesn't get heard. But I wonder if perhaps there's an underlying encouragement to do this, to raise the population, to keep the growth happening. But then again, what uh, what is the advantage of having a whole lot of people who weren't wanted as children? Exactly. Well, it's speculative though, Mike, as far as what the big money wants. We, they, they want profits and they want it for themselves, but I don't think they, they really care about the number of babies and the number of immigrants. They just, as long as the profits accrue to them, if it came out of spec, speculation and markets, they'd be just as happy. But that, well, yeah, I, I agree. Awesome. I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to keep going. Yeah. Um, Bill Tyson is up next. Are you there, Bill? That's right. I am here. Good. Um, full disclosure, I'm a member of the Population Institute of Canada run by Madeline. 
and uh, kudos to her for what she's doing. But my, my comment is simply that the Population Institute is trying so hard to publicize the fact that we are overpopulated, but nobody listens. How do you possibly keep positive in that kind of environment? I don't know. I think I have the problem of being uh, cheerful by nature. Um, also analytical, which is, you know, the stuff that I analyze is, is very depressing. But I think, you know, I, again, I think more people are aware that at least in Canada, our policies of the growth policies that we're pursuing are not in their favor. At least if you look at comments in response to articles that are published, like in the Globe and Mail or, or something like that, um, we we are on social media. You know, we keep we keep promoting our message. We um, I sometimes want, like this, the the world has in, increased by three billion people since I've been active in the <laughs> with Population Institute Canada or since I joined. Um, but and we're you know, supposed. To we're supposed to be called Homo sapiens. That's kind of a misnomer. No, isn't I it? think we're Homo stupidus That's or, it. or <laughs> Homo greeticus. <laughs> well, I've been a member for 23 years anyway, myself too. So, uh, Bill, but we never met because I left town at uh, in 07. But I, I really do think, as, as Steve was saying earlier, that the, the profiteers of growth, they want to keep it happening. Like in Canada, people are making money from all of these immigrants coming in and and the developers like it um bankers like it because they get more mortgages speculators like it and certain cheap labor businesses like it if you go to certain tim hortons or you know places like that you will only see immigrants working there and and so cheap labor you know whatever cheap cheap labor benefits but or cheap labor businesses benefit but i think the what how does that expression go the working man's best friend is a tight labor market and, and we're doing everything in our power to make it a not tight labor market. There's a Russian guy who calls himself angry Canadian immigrant who makes some videos. And he talks about how basically immigrants are, are getting um, the short end of the stick with the immigration policy of bringing a lot of them in. And, you know, they, he's got, he's an IT, but he both he and his wife are working, but they have trouble making ends meet between the high cost of living and the, the rents they have to pay and and everything. So Canada's immigration policy is is not for the benefit of Canadians. And you know the 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 Century Initiative, which wants 100 million Canadians by 2100, says we'll be a bigger, more important country and of more influence in the world with 100 million people. Well, I don't think so. I mean, Norway has more influence than Nigeria and a better quality of life. Um, I think basically the you know the profiteers are. The Century Initiative works for the profiteers of growth, not for, not for Canadians. Plus, hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Trudeau says we are we're a post-national country with no core identity and no mainstream. That's what he actually told the New York Times shortly after he got elected in 2015. Well, if we have no core identity and no, no mainstream, how can we be important? Like we're a bunch of, you know, what in monads walking around with no core identity so what what are our values that we're supposed to project on the world then i'm with you <laughs> uh, and there's a entry here a question from gene and dave doherty um about population having been a, a no-go topic and do you think making religious teachings a no-go topic is also well, <laughs> do you guys want to jump in by, on it? By no go, you mean you're not allowed to talk about it, or <clears throat> I think yeah. that's what he's what what they're saying. But I, I mean, I don't know if Dave wants to jump in or if Jean is there. If she uh, well, it's in. okay. It, kind of, it came from my account, Steve, okay. uh, which is labeled for the two of us. Okay, uh, it was a simple question. You said earlier that some time ago, um, population was a topic that we couldn't discuss. Mm -hmm. And in your presentation, you said you didn't want to go to the the topic of discussing religion's role here. Okay, and but so I'm going to ask you: Do you think that that is in fact problematic? And it's... I wonder, Steve, um, could you please go back to Richard Vanderjak, who seems to have been skipped? 
Uh, I will answer your question, Dave, but I guess we'll go to Richard first, or do we want to? No, no, answer the question. Okay, okay, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question. It's kind of joking when I said we won't talk about religion, because I think that religion has had a, a huge influence, um, and not just the, through local, you know, <clears throat> priests or mullahs or but, um, whatever, temple leaders. Uh, back after the Second World War, when the um, world, when the United Nations had just formed and the World Health Organization was relatively new, its its director was a guy called Brock Chisholm, who was a Canadian uh, humanist and was in favor of um, stabilizing population. And he wanted to make family planning promotion part of what the World Health Organization did, along with child immunization and stuff like that. And the Vatican, which has observer status at the UN got together a group of um, Catholic countries that said that they would withdraw from the UN and everything if family planning was brought up. So it basically squelched the idea of, of the World Health Organization promoting family planning, which I think was a huge, huge um, loss to humanity because back then it probably would have been more accepted. And um, the, the, president of what was then known as Salon was also very much in favor of, of family planning. But the the Vatican has interfered at virtually every population conference and has worked hard to keep family planning from where it's desperately needed, including in the Philippines, where um, Jamie, Cor uh, what what was his last name? Um, the son of Corazon, Aquino, Aquito, Aquino, I think wanted to make family planning available for poor Filipinos and was delayed by several years um, with an appeal to the Supreme Court by the Catholic leadership there and everything like that. So, so you do have interference at the political level. And then you've got interference at, at the local level and also in, in Canada, because I remember uh, back in after the conf Cairo conference in, in September of 1992, shortly thereafter, or 1994, Canada completely withdrew its aid from the um, International Family, um, what is it, Planned Parenthood International. And the reason it did, I was told by three separate parties who aren't connected with, with each other, but in a position to know, was that the, the Catholic bishops, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops told the government that they would encourage their par parishioners in Quebec to vote for separation at the upcoming 1995 referendum, which we know was very, very close, if they continue to support um, Planned Parenthood International. So that's why the, the government withdrew its funding of that. And then I guess it sort of resumed in, in sneaky, not so obvious ways. And then of course, you've got the local priests and mullahs and stuff who teach against it. So so I think, yeah. yeah. That, that I was just going to jump in on that, Madeline, before, because, <clears throat> uh, Islamophobia has been used in many uh, progress, so-called progressive Western countries to silence criticism of that religion. Islamophobia is a political term that was designed specifically to shut down any criticism of Islam. And yes. they very cleverly conflated criticizing an ideology or a religion as one can and promotion of hatred or discrimination against right. the people. So okay, I want to go back to uh, the reason I editorially skipped Richard van der Yacht because he made a very short statement, which was not a question at all. No, I, I did ask a question. So well, I, maybe I missed, I missed it. it. I only see something about um, Stephen Hawking argues that we need to look at moving. Oh, if you go back, Steve, there's Oh, a sorry. Okay, I skipped it. Okay, so I do have a comment and a question. One is uh, Andre Picard actually wrote an, edit, uh, uh, in a, an editorial just a couple of weeks ago on the Globe suggesting that we should actually be providing uh, birth control um, without a medical prescription so that women could just go and get it. Mm -hmm. I think that would do something in terms of population control. But the second mm -hmm. question I had is you, you commented on the, and this was my question, my original question I asked long ago, is that... Um, you commented on the correlation between um, the bird population and the benefits for humans, but I wonder how much of that is correlation versus causation. That was my question and that I asked. Well, well I think the way the survey um, asked people, I, you know, and, and I have to look at the, because that was a few years ago, I looked at it, 
but when people the people were asked to express their or to evaluate their own sort of happiness and they were questioned you know on their income and i guess you can tell where they lived the people could assess i mean it's not like the people were asked how many bird species are where you are but mm. it, it was it was a correlation with that um so if that maybe if that were the only piece of evidence but it seems to be that um being close to nature like i think the developers who can afford it and i've seen some developers houses in in rockcliffe the fanciest area in 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 ottawa they don't want to live in dense housing do they oh, um, I agree. and out where i live which used to be the boonies and still kind of is but i've got you know quite a lot of green space and trees around i you know i can hear the birds when i get up in the morning if i open the open the screen door or have the, you know i can and it and it is um calming i mean yeah so and, and we we see it in how people vote with their feet like it is a phenomenon in, in canada that people are leaving the big cities as they grow like toronto a lot of people are moving out of toronto and into smaller places like Barrie and Aurelia, which as a consequence of that are growing rapidly. And um, in, in BC, they're moving from Kelowna, from Vancouver to Kelowna. In fact, I had a taxi, uh, a ride with a taxi driver in Kelowna who moved because Vancouver was getting too crowded for him. That was a few years ago. Um, yeah, that's understandable. I can see that. And, and then, so then, but the population is still growing because Canada's bringing in so many migrants but it, mm -hmm. it's forcing the growth of smaller towns. Like I remember a few years ago in Ottawa, in the Ottawa area, Manatic was all upset about the growth that um, developers wanted to impose on it. So municipalities are being forced to contend with the growth that the federal government is creating with its policies. Yeah. Okay, uh, Richard, I do apologize, but, yeah, but the, you. your, your question was the third entry that you had made in the chat, and that's why I missed it. Oh, no, that's all right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Bill Reese is up next. <clears throat> Bill, I hope you're still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for our a very excellent summary of current situation. Two comments. First, there's really no such thing as a local population problem. With globalization and trade, we've created a circumstance in which wealthy countries can literally... Um, appropriate through the marketplace, the carrying capacity, or at least the productive capacity of other countries. So that right now, 80% of the world's population live in countries that are dependent on productivity of other countries because of trade flows. So for example, if you look at uh, Japan, you've mentioned Japan a number of times, the people of Japan use five or seven times as much a productive land and water base outside of Japan as exists within the country. So in the absence of trade, they couldn't even support the capital city of Tokyo, let alone the entire population. So globalization and, and trade have, have dissolved the, the borders effectively. In fact, that's what globalization is all about. It's supposed to make uh, a single global economy but it means we are all impoverishing each other at the same time, although some of us are obviously benefiting for a longer period than others. Did, so can I point, comment on that, Bill? Or Absolutely. Oh, uh, like it seems to be that there's a global elite that's benefiting more, and it's not just in like European and North America. It's, it's like, you know, rich Indi Indians, like in of India, course. rich rich Africans, like the rulers of those countries. Like I saw... Mugabe's house, I'll run through that. It's very, very much fancier than mine. Um, so we have this global elite, which is benefiting, I guess, the, the most benefiting from all of this globalization. I don't know how much local populations are, are benefiting. I mean, I read how in Africa, subsist what were subsistence farmers, they're all growing like one kind of crop now. In a, in a particular area so if the market say it's coffee so if the market goes down for that those growers are sol and they are no longer growing their own subsistence stuff as much absolutely yeah globalization has a disastrous effect on many levels in fact the poorest quarter of the world's people where population growth is greatest are not benefiting at all from economic growth because the growing population simply dilutes the benefits of national 
economic growth. So we're in a real fix here. But again, I'm just trying to say that globalization and trade obfuscates or confuses the whole question of, of national borders. And of course, you're right. It's elites in all countries. Every one of us, by the way, on, on this web cert is a part of the global elite. We are beyond the imaginings of people in the poorest parts of Africa or elsewhere. So the other thing, I, I'm a population ecologist, and I just want to make one really important, I think, point that is completely outside the discussion of the United Nations projections or anything else, and that is that human beings are no different from any other mammalian uh, species uh, in what are called case strategic. We will respond to the abundance of resources. For the you know two hundred and fifty thousand years, there was no human growth on Earth worth imagining. It all happened in the last what two hundred and twenty years or so that you've mentioned, because of the abundance of food and resources made available by fossil fuel. So just like any other species, we will go through a boom and a bust phase. Mm -hmm. But ours is going to be a one-off population boom and bust, because we, unlike other species, use technology to deplete not only uh, non-renewable resources, but also renewable resources. You've mentioned the decline of fisheries, forests, soils, and so on. And so we will boom to eight, 10, whatever billion people. Then we will bust, but recovery won't be possible as it is with other species because we will have depleted the essential resource base, the high quality, low hanging fruit necessary for a new civilization to emerge. I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Well, a... I, I agree. And I, I read, um, you know, I've been Chris Clugston. I have Chris Clugston's book, uh, Scarcity and Blip. And basically, we are using non renewable natural resources, limited fossil fuels, but all of the things we have in our computers and cell phones and stuff, all of those rare earths and things, we are mining them at horrendous cost um, environmentally and to the kids or whatever who are mining them. Uh, and w what's going to replace them when they're gone? The uh, so I don't know. So I, you know, I think of that. And, okay, what what are we going to do then? It's the the what then? And I don't see a happy scenario for the. For <clears throat> then. Um, optimistic as I am as a by nature, but so yeah, I I don't I don't see how we can continue. I mean, you know, we might have to go back to hand tools and <laughs> harvesting, you know, with animal power and stuff like that. I don't think the human species will go extinct, but I think our um, in in what is a techno industrial society is is going to be like a blip. Um, yeah, sad to say. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Thanks, Bill. And um, by the way, the fossil fuels will do away with that uh, international globalization and trade that you talked about. Absolutely. <laughs> That'll be part of the collapsing balloon. Yeah. Okay, John Legg, you have a question. How you doing, John? John, well, I'll read it for him. <laughs> I saw him earlier. What are the real reasons that the federal liberals are in favor of a radically higher immigration? How do these liberals justify this policy? Well, I don't know if Madeline knows what the real reasons are. We've pretty well, much said the uh, money. Well, I think it's money and it's I think it's to perpetually uh, keep the Liberal Party in power as well. Yeah. Back in 1990, when Brian Mulroney massively increased immigration levels, it was his immigration minister, Barbara McDougall, who was really pushing for it. Finance Minister Michael Wilson was against it. But Barbara McDougall actually said that they would be a source of voters for conservatives because most newcomers were still voting for the Liberal Party. Uh, so they were, and I, I'm just amazed, the Globe and Mail actually published an article with that in the subtitle, uh, Minister Sees New Source of Voters for Conservatives. Um, so I think it's it's money and it's political power. They want to keep, you know, keep the liberals in power for this. And I think it's for that reason they're talking about lowering the, the voting age, because, you know, young people are more likely to be liberal than conservative. They might change their mind by the time they're 50, but Okay, now, uh, uh, let's go a little bit deeper, if you could, uh, Madeline. The point there is that uh, is it the gross industries, their uh, <clears throat> contributions, 
uh, electorally. In other words, what, what are the what are the mechanics of this? Uh, you say it's the money. Is it through growth industries who will then uh, contribute more and keep the liberals in power that way? Well, that too, but I think the growth industries give money to every political party, so to, to have every political party sort of in hoc to them, but they'll probably give more to the ones that, you know, they, they like. But um, in terms of money, it's, it's obvious how, I mean, speculators will buy land decades before it's developed in the hope that it will be developed. Sure. And, you know, the specu the people, the speculators who bought land on um, the Golden Horseshoe Triangle in southern Ontario, yeah. which Doug Ford is now saying he's going to build on, well, they, they probably will make a lot of money. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the environmental groups are going after Doug Ford, as they should, but these same groups are completely silent about the immigration policy that is driving that growth. Okay, it's just it's just that uh, this sort of question we have to we have to go into it to uh, a large degree. I mean, the megaphone business that's one part of it. Uh, the electoral question, uh, Barbara McDougall, etc. That's another part of it. It's just that if we want to change the policy here in Canada, I think we have to go into that at some depth as to the, the actual uh, mechanics of uh, influencing policies by certain parties. There was a, a paper by somebody called Bob McDermott, yeah. who, referring to Toronto, and 70% um, of the successful, how did it go? 70% of the successful municipal candidates were funded by developers. Ah, so yes, I think you know it starts at it's it occurs at all levels. True, but yes. and it was it wasn't like the developer goes and gives the money. We, you know it could have been a donation from a a cousin or you know something, but he sort of traced the money, and and found that there's a major input from developers, huge input. I think I think you are right. I remember doing some research on that, and. Uh, the city of Ottawa has regulations and you, you analyze those and you see that yes, if you are on the planning committee in, sit, in the city, uh, the amount of uh, contributions you get is incredibly high mm -hmm. compared to being head of transportation committee or right. other, other committees. And that's, that's, that shows it. Okay, I, I think I've done, uh, I've had my go at you and I just uh, want you to keep up your uh, natural uh, uh, bright uh, view on life because it's a pretty depressing thing we deal with here. Okay, thanks Madeline. Thanks John. <laughs> okay, I'm having a bit of trouble with some of the entries in <clears throat> the chat. Um, there's somebody with the initials RV who said that uh, they've been trying to talk or comment. And also Rosemary Kralik has said that she's been trying to talk, but I didn't see any questions. Uh, and also I've been asked to try to tell who's on deck, but the way this chat is scattered, I have to skip through two or three or four comments to try to figure out who's really got a question. Yeah. But there's only a, a handful left. I know we're at 90 minutes and we can go on for another 10 or 15. Um, we are at 90 minutes on more. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to take, as the president of KCOR, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Madeline for giving this marvelous presentation that certainly has generated a huge amount of discussion. It is a very difficult topic to talk about and you've done a marvelous job of it, Madeline. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jean, very kind. I, it was a pleasure talking to KCOR. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to say for those who are still here or will be listening to this later, 
please go and look at our website, canadiancore.com. If you register on the Stay Informed section, you will get the link to this particular talk when it becomes available, as well as all the other videos and presentations that we've presented over the last few years, including some of the previous ones that Madeline has given. So please go to canadiancore.com. In addition, if you're interested in finding out more about us as an organization and wish to become a member, the information is there on our website. And if you wish to subscribe, please do so at the button after you have gone on to the Stay Informed section. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for coming today and Madeline, especially for talking to us about this very, very difficult subject. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madeline. If a few of you